Okay, we're recording. Okay, so tonight's tonight's class, which is uh, the usual Monday night Pirkeiavos, which um, I'm making a, a cheap commercial for. Um, Mon- Monday night Pirkeiavos, we we have an opportunity to discuss not only the Mishnah but but issues and things that are uh, that are going on in the world, Torah perspectives of things, and um, I do encourage um, I encourage everyone to uh, to join us. It's a um, I think it's a it's a wonderful 45 minutes or, or hour um, to uh, to spend thinking about things and getting a getting a certain perspective on uh, on things that happen. We do it through the Mishnah, through the guys of the Mishnah, and I just want to change one thing. We do it through the guys of the Mishnah, and um, therefore the tonight's Mishnah is Chapter Five, Mishnah Hey, and the Mishnah says as follows. Asar and Nisim Nasu Lavasenu Besa Mikdosh. There were 10 miracles that were done to our forefathers in the temple. And then the Mishnah goes on to list the miracles. The Mishnah says that, for example, no woman ever miscarried from the smell of Basar Kodesh and the smell of, of sanctified meat. That if a woman was, uh, would have a, uh, while she was pregnant, would have a craving, she wasn't allowed to satisfy that craving if it was for, um, for sanct- sacrificial meat that she wasn't allowed to eat. And nevertheless, no matter how much a woman would crave, it never would cause her any harm. The second miracle that's listed in the Mishnah is that velo isriach basar kodesh me'olam, that the sanctified meat in the temple, sometimes the meat would be sitting around for quite a while, and there was no refrigeration, there was no temple, temple refrigerators. Nevertheless, it never spoiled. There were no flies. The third miracle was that there were no flies ever in the temple, which is an incredible thing because, um, you know, September, October, November in San Diego, you leave you leave something out for a half a second, you have either ants or you have flies. You know, it's gonna you, you, it's it's a very common thing. I'm um, in Israel in, in August when it's it was sweltering um, outside and it's it's very hot. Nevertheless, one of the miracles was. Um, we're not going to discuss tonight why these miracles needed to happen. We'll talk about that next week in Mitzvah Hashem. But just the, the, I want to give the sense of the miracles. Um, the low era carry the Kohen Gadol by Yom Kippurim. A Kohen Gadol never became um, impure on Yom Kippur so that he wouldn't be able to do the service. The low Kibu Gishamim Eishalatzeh Racha. There was um, fire every single day in the temple. And the rains never put out that fire. There was a pilot light that was on really 24-7 in the temple, and the rains never put that out. There was a pillar of smoke that came from the altar that went straight up to the sky. That pillar of smoke was, um, it, 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 was, it, it was unwavering. When you would go on the uh, on the Tayelet, on the Has Pramanad, which they call it today, when you would see over where the temple was, you would see this pillar of smoke and look like a column, like a like a marble column that was going up to the heavens. No matter how much wind, no matter how much weather, no matter how much rain was coming, it wouldn't deviate one iota. Okay, and, and the Mishnah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not going to continue on. The, 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 the Mishnah says um, that, there were, that, that it was so crowded inside of the temple that they were standing in f- nose to face. In other words, my, my, my nose was up against the back of your head. That's how tight we were. That's how compacted we were in the temple. If somebody wanted to move, everybody had to move so that one person could move their hand. Nevertheless, when it came time to bow, when we heard the ineffable name of God, there was enough room to bow um, inside, of the, inside of the temple. And bowing in the temple wasn't like we do, just bowing over at the waist. Bowing in the temple was lying on the ground, prostrate, spread eagled on the ground. There was enough room for every single person to be able to do that. Nobody ever said to their friend that I don't have enough space in Jerusalem. There was always enough space for every single person who needed to sleep in Yerushalayim to sleep in Yerushalayim. Now, we understand that in the temple, there there was these miracles that every single day, if you needed to find God, if you needed a proof, if you needed something clear and tangible, that there was a God in this world, all you had to do was to go to the temple. And when you would see these miracles, so then it would, it would clearly remind you that God is there. You know, these miracles happened in, in Israel once we built the temple. 
And the reason is, is because we used to exist in a way that miracles were there all the time. Before the temple was built, when we were in the desert, we saw miracles anywhere and anywhere you looked there were miracles there was miracles with the water there were little rivulets of water that were coming through the entire camp of the jewish people in the desert there was mun that fell every single day there was there, there were clouds of glory that covered them there were miracles everywhere and then when we came into the land of israel and we started to settle so then the miracles weren't as apparent and therefore, God needed to ensure that there was a place that we could connect with him. There was a place that we could go, that there would be clarity that there was, in fact, a God. And that's why going to Shalayim became really such an important part of our existence as Jews. If you look in the Torah, there are times in the year where we're obligated to go to Jerusalem. Three times a year, Yerah calls the All of your males have to go to Jerusalem. Every single one of us is obligated to go on Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot. That's where we spent our holiday. And the reason is because God wanted to get us to Yerushalayim, because he knew that if we were wavering and if we were falling and failing, if we were if, if we were slipping away, all we had to do was to go to Yerushalayim, and in Yerushalayim, we would be uplifted. In Yerushalayim, we would once again plug in. We would see God. We would have no doubts, and that would carry us through until the next holiday. When we took tithes, there were times during the year we needed to bring a sacrifice. There were times during the year where we were forced to come to Yerushalayim. God wanted Jerusalem to be the center. And as the center, it, it had the ability to be able to, to awaken us. The name Jerusalem was built not, on a, not in outside of, the, of a town. It was built in an ear. It was built in a city. The word ear is the same as the word are, which means to be awake. It was a place that was awake, that was alive. And when we got there, we became awake and alive because we plugged in to the power of Yerushalayim. Then we're told that at the end of the holidays, we're told to go home, to go back to our houses. But of course we go home. If, if Pesach is over, you have to leave Yerushalayim, you're going home. Why would there be a commandment to go home? Because what the Torah is telling us is that what God wanted is that we would take the inspiration that we got from there and we would bring that inspiration into our daily lives. That's the message of the Mishnah. The message of the Mishnah is, is that we need to remember those miracles because we can't see them anymore. We don't have that place anymore. We don't have Yerushalayim. But when we talk about it, when we, when we remind ourselves of it, when we connect emotionally to it, we recognize that there are places and there are events where God makes himself apparent and clear. And it's in those places that we have to connect to so that when we waver, that lifts us up and gives us the strength to be able to continue. And the truth is, is that God gives us people to allow us to be able to connect to him also. And the embodiments. God gives us people. He gives us the gedolim. He gives us the giants of Torah and the giants of Jewry that give us that that are embodiments of the message of God. They are examples of how we're meant to live with God. That's why the petira, the loss, the death of a gadol, is like Sreifas Beis Elokeinu, is like the burning of the Beis HaMikdash. Because just like the Beis HaMikdash was a place, was a physical place that we could connect to in this world to be able to see the reflection of God, our gedolim, our giants, are not just interesting people. They're not just great people. They're not just scholars. They're not just intellectuals. But they are reflections of God, strong reflections that each and every one of us are meant to be. But they've perfected that task of being a reflection of God. And we look into their eyes, we look into their lives, and we're inspired and we're uplifted. And that's why we spend so much time on the concept of kavod, of giving honor to our gedolim, giving honor to our giants, giving honor to our rabbis and our teachers, because they're not merely filling our heads with Torah, but they become our, our places, that they are reflections of godliness. They're reflections of the divine spirit, they're reflections of the divine presence, and they're meant to have that kind of effect on us. 
And that's why the loss this past weekend, this past Shabbos, Erev Shabbos and on Shabbos, of two giants, two very, very different giants, but two giants in one short period is really so devastating. But let's look at who they were and what we have to learn from them and from their petira. You know, in this week's parsha, Sarah Imenu dies. Avram Avinu goes to Hebron to buy a burial plot. And it says he goes, Lispod le Sarah Vilivkosa, that he goes to eulogize Sarah and to cry over her. Now, normally, there are tears immediately when a person dies, there's crying. And then there's Hespid, then there is eulogy, then there are words. Why over here was it the opposite? That Avram Avinu went lispod le Sarah. He went first to eulogize and then to cry. Because the crying only comes when you understand the value of a person. When you understand what they contributed to this world, you understand what the, what the world was like with them inside of it. Avram Avinu recognized that nobody knew who Sarah was. And therefore they didn't even understand how changed and different their world was now that Sarah was no longer there. And therefore, the first thing he had to do is lispaid le Sarah. He had to talk about her. He had to explain who she was and what role she played in the world. And then, Valif Kaisa, then the tears would come. And for the next few minutes, I want to explain a little bit who these Gedolim were and what role they played in our world. And then perhaps come to an understanding of maybe why the two of them left this world in the same moment, in the same time period. Rabdavid Feinstein was the Rosh Hashiva of MTJ, Sifta Tavares Yushalayim. It was the yeshiva of Rav Moshe Feinstein. Rav Moshe Feinstein was the God Ador, was the great giant of the generation. And much of the halacha, much of the law that we follow, much of the practice of the common uh, practice of law really has to do with Rabbi Feinstein and his dissemination of Torah and his, and his clarification of halacha. And Rabbi David, his son, carried on that legacy. Through the Hespedim, what they've said about Rabbi David is that his hasmada, his ability to, to sit and to learn and to concentrate, was incredible. Triplet grandchildren would come tearing into the room and you wouldn't always recognize their presence because he was pouring away and connected to his Torah. He was a god, he was a giant in Psach Halacha, in rendering clear rulings in Halacha. Many great rabbis deferred to him. Rav Shechter would often go to him when something needed to be clarified in Rav Moshe Feinstein's Piske Halacha and Rav Moshe Feinstein's decisions in Halacha, they would defer to him. Rabbi Yashiv, the great halachic decisor in Israel, in Jerusalem, said that he was the Pose Kador. He was the real halachic leader of America. On many occasions, I called him to ask him about certain halachos. My Rebbe Reb David Cohen would on occasion tell me, I can't touch that. Call Reb David Feinstein. I remember the first time that he told me to call Reb David Feinstein. So I told, I said to him, Rebbe, I, like, I don't, I don't know the guy. You're like, I, I feel a little weird calling him. He said to me, just tell him David told you to call. He was very accessible, very reachable. You could speak to him about anything. And he was very clear about the path that a Jew needed to take in his halachic life 
and in his ethical life. But his godless, his real greatness, though he's known for and spoken about, about his halacha, but his greatness shown in another area. Moshe Rabbeinu, before he died, asked that his successor be an Isha Sheruach Bo. And our rabbis explain what does that mean, a man who the spirit is in him. It means that a person who would deal with the spirit of every person. He had an incredible connection with his Talmudim, with his students. He had an incredible connection with his Balabatim. He had a, an incredible connection with every single person that came to see him, Basher Husham, whatever position they were in, whoever they were, whatever kind of person they were. He gave his time and his energy and his concentration. He gave his concern. He loved every single person. And it poured out of him. His Torah was amazing. He wrote Svarim on the Haggadah. He wrote incredible things in halacha. His Torah was unbelievable. But his midos, his character, his modesty, his humility was legendary. My brother-in-law, Rabbi Lif, who is one of his Talmidim, was interviewed on the radio today. And he said that ha'ikar ha'midot, the ikar, the main thing, is his midos was his character. When Shoal was chosen as king of the Jewish people, the Navi tells us he was nechba el akelim, that he was hiding amongst the vessels. He didn't want anybody to know that he was chosen as king. He was so humble. Until Ramesha died, everybody knew him as Ramesha's son. Almost with no identity, he sat behind a beam in the base medrash, and he sat there and he learned, eventually started giving shirim in the, in the yeshiva. But he was known as Rav Moshe's son. They point out in all the Hespedim that if you look at pictures of him, he's not wearing the clothes of a Rosh Hashiva. The Rosh Hashiva, is, there's a certain hat and a certain kind of long frock that they wear. Never would take that on. Because his humility was incredible. He was, a, in, he was a perfect Evan Hashem, a servant of God's. When he was told recently that he had to drink on Yom Kippur, his family was worried that he'd be upset. And he said, why would I be upset? The same God that told me that I have to fast on Yom Kippur is the same God that tells me now that I have to drink on Yom Kippur. This is now my Avodah Hashem. This is my service of God. Reb David, his family, and everybody with whom they surrounded themselves were entirely void of any kind of externalities. They were pure, 100% limud ha-Torah, learning Torah and connection to God and service of God. Chesed, mitzvos, that's it. They asked him once if he would sit on the dais or sit in the front. And he said, no, no, I'm much happier sitting back here with the Talmud and with the students. And it wasn't just a false humility. It was where he was most comfortable. With my own eyes, I saw an incredible thing at the Siyam Ashas. 90,000 Jews witnessed this. Reb David was supposed to give a very important conclusion to the Shas. He had an incredible, almost the most important slot in the entire siyum, in the entire completion of the Talmud, of that event at MetLife Stadium. 90,000 people were there. And one of the Gedoli Rosh Hashiva, one of the Gedoli Hador, Reb Shmuel Kamenetsky, was also there. And Reb David said, let Reb Shmuel do it. And he gave up a moment that would have been so earth-moving, a moment that would have been so incredible. But he didn't need that covet. He didn't need that honor. He didn't need all eyes looking at him. 
He was happy sitting in the back with the Talmidim. Rabbi Aryan Yilibowitz wrote that it's so telling that at a funeral, very often the family will stand in front of the casket and will ask for mechila, will ask for pardon and forgiveness from the nifta, from the one that died. And usually it's a moment to air a little bit of the difficulty that they had with that person. They ask that, forgive us if we ever were pagain, you're covered, if we ever took away from your honor, if we didn't call you enough, if we weren't involved with you enough, if we didn't take care of you enough. Even children that have been incredible to their parents. But sometimes you feel a little pang and you want to make sure that if there was a little thing that was off, that it's cleared before they go into the ground. And you ask for mechila, you ask for pardon and forgiveness from the nifter, from the one that's passed. When the family asked mechila at the funeral, they didn't focus on asking for forgiveness for a lack of kavod, for a lack of honor that they might have shown him. But rather they asked him for forgiveness for not being kind enough to other people the way Reb David would have wanted. He was a paragon. He was a beacon of light, of midos tovos, of beautiful char- character, of bitachon, of faith in God. And he lit up his little corner of the world. Most of us here never even heard of him. But every single one of us benefited from having a light on like that in the world. We benefited from his midos. We benefited from his beautiful character, from his love of people, from the light that he brought in. Every single one of us was a beneficiary. And when a god like that leaves this world, the world is a little darker. The lights have gone off. And at the same time, Rabbi Lord Dr. Jonathan Sachs also departed from this world. a member of parliament, chief rabbi, a prolific writer, an intellectual, a scholar, a Torah teacher, what we call an eshkol, ish shekolbo, somebody who had everything. He was comfortable in secular knowledge and in secular understanding and secular philosophy and thought. And he was comfortable in Torah and in Jewish thought. He was a giant in moral clarity and in the Torah's sacred, timeless values. I had the opportunity once to spend a Shabbos with him in London. It was an unofficial Shabbos in the sense that he wasn't working, he was just really davening in the same place. And I spent much time talking to him. I had an opportunity to listen to him. And the warmth and the passion, the genuine love of Torah and God were readily apparent and incredibly inspiring. And it has to be that he was filled with the love of Torah and that he was filled with the love of God because it could be the only way to explain his ability to influence the entire world in the eyes of so many people he was their rabbi in the eyes of many Jews Jews who would never even open up a sefer never even look inside of a Jewish book on Shabbos would make sure that they downloaded his his divrei Torah on the parsha And religiously, they would learn that. Non-Jews looked to him for guidance, 
He was the moral compass for so many leaders in the world. He had a sincere love and connection to God, which was inspiring to Jews and Gentiles alike. The fact that he was an intellectual, and in many has spayed him, they spend so much time on that, that's not his godless. His godless was the depth of his connection that he had with the Ribbona Shalom and with the master of the universe. It wasn't an intellectual connection. It was a deep emotional connection. The Talmud speaks of Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya and his great ability to defend the Jews from the Romans. The Romans loved to make these disputations to try to disprove God. And Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya was a great proponent and a great champion for the Jewish people. On his deathbed, they were so stressed, they were so worried. Because when he dies, who's going to defend them against the nations of the world. Well, the Talmud says that he turned to them and he said, you have nothing to worry about. Because when the light of Torah goes out, the light of the rest of the world goes out also. And therefore, they're no longer going to be formidable opponents. But the question you have to wonder is that why were they stressing? It wasn't so difficult to defend against the heathens, to defend against those without, without much knowledge? Any rabbi could have done that. And I think the answer is, is that no, not every rabbi could do that. It was Davka, Rabbi Yoshua ben Hananya, because of his sincerity, because of his deep connection to God. It wasn't his erudition, it wasn't his ability to his oratory skills, it wasn't his ability to be able to be so erudite it was coming from the depths of his soul and I think that, that describes Rabbi Sachs that every message that he said wasn't a message that was a good vart it was an interesting way of seeing things but it was a message that came from the very depths of his existence he was once asked by a group of children, do you really believe in God? And he answered them and he said that to say that he believed in God is a great understatement. I have, he explained, a truly deep connection with God. I have feelings of love for God. A truly deep connection to him. That connection poured out of him in his interactions with Jews, his interactions with Gentiles, in all parts of life. He was asked once, if he ever had a crisis of faith, and he responded that he had many crises of faith, but no crisis in the faith in God but a crisis in the faith of humanity. He said that he never had a crisis of faith in God because he never expected the impossible from God. I know he put each and every one of us here for a reason, he said, and we're supposed to discern that and then walk on ahead. He said that for him, the critical moment that defined his faith in God was this week's parsha, Parshas Chayesara. Avram Avinu comes down from the Akedah, from the moment where he was going to sacrifice his son, and where God told him that no, now was not the time. Where his whole world was going to be torn asunder because the one son that God gave him, he was going to kill. And when he returns back home, he sees that his wife has died because of that event. 137 years old. He had received three promises from God that he would get the land of Israel. Seven times God promised him that he would have children. Four times God promised him in the Torah that he was going to have children and that he would be the father of many nations. It was after all his name, Avraham, Avamein Goyim. But he had one son, where were the nations? 
Why didn't Avram Avinu have a crisis of faith? It would have been justified. Rather explains Rabbi Sachs that he knew his alech lefonai veheye somim that God said to him, walk before me and be pure, be whole. His job was to forge ahead. And look at what happens in the Pasha. He buys the plot to bury his wife. He marries off his son. He himself gets married and has a bunch, six more children, who become the fathers of many nations. Instead of expecting God to do him, to do it for him, God was expecting him to do the hard work for God. Said Rabbi Sachs, once I understood that, I never had a crisis of faith. I never asked, Kaili, Kaili, Lama Azavtani, God, why have you never left me? He believed so strongly in Hashkoch and divine providence. I heard him tell once an amazing story that in 2010, the Princeton Theological Seminary gave him an award called the Abram Kyber Prize, which is awarded to somebody who made a significant contribution to Dutch neo-Calvinist theology. He couldn't understand why in the world he got that prize. He discussed it with his wife. He said that every time things like this would happen, he would always ask himself, why did that just happen? What does God want from me? This was a hard one to figure out. Two years later, the Dutch parliament banned shrita. They banned ritual slaughter. The Dutch community turned to him and invited him to speak to parliament on the issue of shrita. Kyber, Abraham Kyber, whose prize he had won, was the prime minister about a hundred years earlier. And as he stood up, he was able to drop his credentials and able to say that he was the recipient of Abraham Kyber's prize. And it gave him a status and an ability to be able to accomplish things that otherwise he wouldn't have been able to do. And not for a second did he look at himself and say, wow, I pulled off a good one. He understood how God was running the world. Recently, he addressed the question of why bad things happen to good people. And a woman asked him, Rabbi Sachs, we've asked this question to you before. You told my mother that you have, you, you have no answer. Do you have anything more to say about this issue for us? And very emotionally, Rabbi Sachs said, God doesn't want us to understand why bad things happen to good people. He doesn't want us to understand why there's evil in the world. Because if we ever understood it, we would be forced to accept that bad things happen to good people. We'd be forced to accept that there's evil here. And God doesn't want us to accept those bad things so that we will continue to fight against evil and the injustices of this world. And that's why there's no answer to that question. God has arranged that we will never have an answer to that question. Rabbi Sachs, for so many, was the moral compass for so many was the teacher of morality. For so many was a guiding light 
in what it means to be Jewish, what it means to love Judaism, what it means to put God in your life. And he lit up. He lit up a part of the world. He lit up a significant part of the world. But there were plenty who were not actively engaged and involved in him and his light. But who lived in a world where that light existed and were uplifted. Their lives were illuminated. And when that light went out, the world has become a darker place. So how do we deal with the petira, with the death of Gedalim, of giants, of leaders, of people who we call any or Eida, they're the eyes of the Jewish people. We see through them. They are our ability to see the reflection of God. They are our Bate Mikdash. They are our sacred places, our holy temple that we can go to and connect to the master of the universe. I was struck with an incredible thought. Because they're two very different Gedalim. They played two very different roles in this world. And there is no comparison between them. Each excelled in the task that they were given by God. They existed in two completely different worlds, in two different kinds and aspects of Judaism. And I think that perhaps their petira at the same time gives us an opportunity, leaves us with a profound and powerful message that there, the Torah is like a tapestry. And there are many, many pieces to the Torah. And as long as you're connected to the tapestry, as long as you're connected to God and to His Torah and to the authenticity of the transmission of the Torah from Sinai, as long as your values are the same there's a little bit this way and a little bit that way. We always tell over the beautiful statement in the Talmud that the Talmud says in the future, there's going to be this great circle dance in the sky. That when we sit with God after 120, there's going to be the tzaddikim that are going to be around and surrounding God. And they're going to dance. Can you imagine that that's what you have to look forward to? Square dancing forever? But our rabbis explain that this is an incredible lesson and message. That there we are circling, holding hands around God, and we begin to dance. And an incredible thing happens. When you dance, you move into the position of the person in front of you, and the person behind you moves into your position. And then when you take your next step, you move into the position that was two steps in front of you, and the people behind you now advance two steps. And an amazing realization happens. We're still looking at God. It's the same God. Whether I'm standing over here or whether I'm standing over here, it's the same God. We slip into intolerance. We slip into a place that the way that we practice Judaism is the only way to practice Judaism and anybody who is a little more or a little less, anybody who is a little blacker or a little whiter, is trafe, is no good, is outside the camp. And I'm not sure that that's the place we're supposed to be. And when two gedalim of two different sides, two different perspectives, two different parts of that circle, leave us at the same time, we have to focus and ultimately, what were they? Ultimately, they were teaching the same thing. Love God and live with Him every day. 
They're just spokes in a wheel. They're just parts of the same chain. And maybe the light that went out, maybe the light that we need to rekindle inside of ourselves is the light of tolerance, of acceptance, of understanding that there are so many perspectives and ways. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about within the context, only within the context of Torah, only within the context of our tradition, only in the context of the Torah from Sinai. But even within that, there are so many different flavors and perspectives, so many different sides to it. In order to be able to recognize the godless, the greatness of Rabbi David Feinstein and to recognize his contribution into the world, to be able to recognize the greatness of Rabbi Sachs and to understand his contribution in the world, we have to possess the ability to be able to see the world from many perspectives to open our eyes and to recognize God has many, many emissaries. Every person in the world has their task. Every person in the world fits into a certain place and has a mission and a job to do. And though our missions are not always the same, our goals are. Our tachlis is, our direction and focus is. A lot of times we talk about when giants die, that we're meant to take something from them and to incorporate that into our lives. And maybe one of the things that we need to incorporate into our lives at this moment of the patira of these two giants is the ability to be able to accept the ability to be able to open our hearts and to open our arms to every type of Jew, to every person in the world, and to be able to fill ourselves with the understanding that we're here to connect to God. Each in our way, each with our strengths, each with our weaknesses, but each and every one of us are meant to find that place so that our lives are illuminated by the light of God and that we live lives that are reflections of the divine presence. Those are my thoughts. Their souls should be bound up in the everlasting bond of life. And that we can't say that we should be blessed that we never lose our Torah giants. It's inevitable. But I think the blessing is that we start to open our eyes and see our giants, see those that are reflections of God, and use that reflection to enhance our own lives long before they pass from this world. Okay, I'm going to take everyone off of mute. For those that would like to stay around for a minute, I have a daf yomi in a minute, but those that like to stay around, say hello. That's good. And if not, it was great to see everybody. Remember next Monday night, same time, same bad time, same bad channel. Um, 7.30, Monday evening. Same place. Rabbi, do you know, um, this is Brian here, how are you? Hi, Brian. <laughs> You know, do you, do you know if there's, um, I, I saw Rabbi Sachs's website put a link to the Hesped from the, the Hesped at his funeral. Do you know if there's something similar for Rabbi Feinstein? Uh, yes. Feinstein? Yes, I think Rabbi Reich actually sent out, um, sent out a link to Hespedim. I'm not sure that if it's only to, um, to Rabbi Feinstein, but if you send, if, if, to, to Rabbi Sachs, but if you um, type in Google, Rabbi David Feinstein, um, you, you can even put in the word Hesped, 
and it'll it'll send you to a link. There is his funeral was is is still online, and you can still see it. And it, 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 the the Hespedim are incredible. Obviously, the Hespedim are in, are in you know yeshivish, the mixture of of English and uh, you know and, and, and Hebrew, but they're but they're very beautiful. The most poignant of them was what was the 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 Gadol Hador that was where Shmuel Kamenetsky, who's himself. Shmuel is ninety. I think he's ninety six. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's from another generation. Shmuel, with energy like you've never seen in your life from a 96-year-old. He bounds up. He just bounces up to the, to the podium, and he speaks for 30 seconds. And he says, I, I don't know what to say. He was just gishmak in everything he did. He was awesome in every single aspect. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes the less you say, the more powerful and the better it is. And to have, just to see the, uh, that guttle, just to see him and to hear his words, it was, it, it was just incredibly uplifting. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good thing, again, a good thing to see. And, to, and, and it, whether you understand everything or not, it doesn't make a difference. It was also incredible is that before he started to speak, he, you could hear on the microphone, he asked the people around him, should I speak in English or should I speak in Yiddish? Now, Yiddish is the language of, you know, in the Torah world, and even today, I mean, it's the, the language of Hespedim, it's the language of eulogies, it's the, it's the language that's used. But Shmuel wanted to know what people, what was going what was going to be the most effective for people. And they told him to speak in English, and he said, fine. But that he had the sensitivity not to say, look, you know, I speak Yiddish, I'm going to speak in Yiddish. But he had this, the sensitivity to, to, to ask, what's the best thing for me to speak in? Through, through the Hespadim, through the, the eulogies, and, and that we see, we get a glimpse of who he was by seeing the, the people around him, by seeing his sons, his grandson who, who, who gave Hespadim. You you see the reflection of the father, and it's incredible. Right. How old was Moshe when he passed away? Reb Moshe was, I think, eighty something. Reb Moshe and Reb Moshe died um, thirty. He, he he died in the same period, thirty days um, difference between them. But he and Reb Yaakov Kamenetsky, who was Reb Shmuel Kamenetsky's father. Happened to be my father's Rebbe. And one day I'll tell you the story. He happened to have been my fa- my grandfather and great uncle saved um, Rebbe Kamenetsky's life, Rebbe Yaakov Kamenetsky's life. Um, and brought him, they, they were able to, to successfully bring him to um, North America. And uh, he was very close with, he was my father's Rebbe. He was very, we were very, very close with the, with the family. They died in like 30 days from each other. I remember that at that time I was living in Australia and I heard that they died like a month after they died. You know, Australia is, Australia is not just like far away. It's, it's buried under a rock. And I, and I, heard, I, I, I heard nothing. It was, uh, it was an incredible <laughs> thing. But um, so Ramesha, Ramesha was, I think, in, in his 80s. I think he was in his 80s. The, the Hesvedim were on Rabbi Reich's note about uh, an hour ago. Right. Yeah. The link to both of them. Right. So, so you should be able to. The, it, 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 you should be able to get to the uh, the spadium of Rabbi Feinstein. You know, you just you you type in the name and you just come up with some with really great things. You know, the things that people write about him, things that people are saying about him. You know, the mo- lo- more um, off the cuff kind of things, um, less official, and uh, it's also it just gives you an understanding again, an understanding of the light that we had, and and hopefully a little inspiration to say that I would I would much rather have known this in my lifetime rather than have to look backwards and find out, oh my God, and I didn't realize we had that. Which is two weeks from now's Pasha. But Yates and Yaakov, when Yaakov leaves his home, so it says that, that Yaakov leaves and Rashi says that why does it say that Yates Yaakov, Yaakov left? I mean, of course he left. If he went to another place, he had to have leave the place that he was in. So the rabbis, Rashi explains that the reason why it says Vayetze Yaakov, that Yaakov left because when a tzaddik, when a righteous person leaves a place, so then the light of that place leaves also the beauty, the, the glory of that place. 
And that a lot of times people don't even realize that that was there. And it's only afterwards that people look back and say, oh my God, look at, look at what we had and it's no longer here. And that's, that's a, sort of a sad place to be because we, we have, we have so, many, so many great giants of Torah, so many, so many leaders, so much awesome things out there that very often we don't even become aware of them until Le'elenu, until they, they pass from the world. Okay, it was really awesome, awesome, awesome to see everybody. We should know from simchas, from happy things, from beautiful things, the lights should once again illuminate the Jewish people. We should be lifted out of this, out of this sorrow and of this, of these feelings, and that we should know only from simchas, from joy, and from happiness. Amen. 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 Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Good night, everyone. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna okay. click off, and those that are staying for Daf Yomi, just click back on. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi.